Thank you very much. Good afternoon, y'all, and welcome to the 32nd anniversary of the Miami Book Fair. I'm Dr. Nicholas Beza, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here to this book fair today. You'll see all across our campus there are many different venues, and I hope you've had a chance to see others. This year, um, well, actually, first, if you'd like to consider becoming a friend of the fair, you're in the right building. Just downstairs in 310411, uh, your char charitable contribution could go to support this wonderful book fair this year and in the future. So if you'd like to become a friend of the fair, please do so downstairs. We also have a way, uh, another way to support the fair, using your technology. If you'd like to text BOOK, B-O-O-K, to 501-501 to donate $10, you can do so now. You'll receive a text back asking you to confirm your donation. Just reply yes. I'm saying that you can do so now because in a moment I'm going to ask you to turn off your technology. But if you would like to make a donation, please turn on your technology and do so now. We're also grateful to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation, OHL, Ariano, and the Bachelor Foundation, and so many more that you'll see listed on the signs all over the fair. Miami Book Fair is a year-long endeavor. Today is not the only day, and tomorrow is not the last day of the book fair. So please attend our events all year. After the discussion today, there'll be a brief question and answer period, and then just down the hall and around the corner, there'll be a signing session. So it's time for me now to ask you to turn off your technology, 
Silence all of your phones, unless you're still donating, then please complete that, and then turn off your technology. And I will ask Lydia Martin to come up and introduce our guest authors. Lydia? Hello, happy Miami Book Fair, everyone. Uh, I'm Lydia Martin, I'm a columnist with the Miami Herald, and I'm very honored to be introducing this very amazing panel today. Uh, Ruth Behar, who will be the moderator today, is a MacArthur Award-winning writer and a cultural anthropologist known for her work about the search for home in our global era. She was born in Havana, Cuba, and frequently visits and writes about her native island. Among her books, she is the author of The Vulnerable Observer, Anthropology That Breaks Your Heart, An Island Called Home, Returning to Jewish Cuba, and Traveling Heavy, a, memory, a memoir in between journeys. She is the editor of the pioneering anthology Bridges to Cuba, Puentes a Cuba, which will be reissued this year in a 20th anniversary edition. Her poetry is included in The Whole Island, Six de Decades of Cuban Poetry, and in several handmade books designed by Cuban book artist Rolando Esteves. Richard Blanco is the fifth inaugural poet in US history, the youngest first Latino immigrant and gay person to serve in such a role. Born in Madrid to Cuban exiled parents and raised in Miami, the negotiation of cultural identity and place characterizes body of work. He is the author of two acclaimed memoirs, The Prince of Los Cucuyos, A Miami Childhood, which explores his coming of age and his attempts to understand his place in America while grappling with his burgeoning artistic and sexual identities. For all of us, one today, an inaugural poet's journey, and three award award-winning poetry collections, Looking for the Gulf Motel, Directions to the Beach of the Dead, and City of a Hundred Fires. Also a children's book of his presidential inaugural poem, One Today, illustrated by uh, Dave Pilkey. Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Liz Balmaceda is food editor and dining critic at, for the Palm Beach Post. She has worked as a foreign correspondent, magazine writer, television news producer, and Metro columnist. It was as a columnist for the Miami Herald that she won the 1993 Pulitzer Prize for commentary and later shared a second Pulitzer for breaking news. Um, she was um, one of the very first people in this uh, town to move the Cuba conversation forward before moving the Cuba conversation forward was cool. Um, she has authored and co-authored books that include the memoir of Miami's doctor to the homeless, Pedro Jose Greer, called Waking Up in America, the memoir of television anchor Maria Elena Salinas, I Am My Father's Daughter, and a novel, Sweet Mary. Born in Matanzas, Cuba, where he still lives, Rolando Esteves is a visual artist and a poet who works in multiple mediums, including drawing, painting, installation, performance, stage design, and handmade book design. He is the author of La Vena Rota, a volume of poems about his memories of his exiled Cuban family, and is the recipient of major honors, including the Cuban National Book Design Award and the distinction Hijo Ilustre de la Ciudad from the city of Matanzas. A co-founder of Ediciones Vigia, he, is, he created over 500 handmade artist books between 1995 and 2013, which he collected, which are collected by the British Naz National Museum, MoMA, and the US Library of Congress. Uh, as well as numerous universities in the U.S. He now directs his own imprint, El Fortín, in which he is creating limited edition, one-of-a-kind artist books that are rapidly gaining recognition for their unique beauty and cultural poetics. Born and residing in Cienfuegos, Cuba, Orlando Félix García Martínez is a historian and writer. He directs the Cienfuegos branch of the UNIAC, Writers and Artists Union, and is a founding member of the Uni Unión de, de Historiadores de Cuba in Cienfuegos. He teaches history and social cultural anthropology at the University of Cienfuegos and is a prolific and highly respected author of numerous major articles and a dozen books about the history of slavery and slavery emancipation in Cuba. He has lectured about his research at prestigious universities in the US, Europe, and Latin America and has been a visiting scholar at the David Rockefeller Center for Latin American Studies at Harvard University. He has been honored with the distinction Por la Cultura Nacional de la República de Cuba. Welcome, everyone. Hi, everyone. 
Well, thanks to everybody for coming out today, family and friends, and many, many thanks to the book fair and to Lisette Mendes and her whole incredible team, the wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book fair this year. So I'm going to be the moderator, so I'm going to try to be brief, which means let me keep my watch here, and if not, maybe my aunt will tell me when I'm talking for too long. And uh, so let me begin by saying that Throughout the 90s, when I began traveling uh, to Cuba, I would stop in Miami and I would visit my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. And she didn't like that I was going to Cuba so much. And she would always say, ¿Qué se te perdió en Cuba? You know, what, what did you lose in Cuba? What, what are you trying to find there? And I wasn't sure. I really wasn't. Uh, this was the grandmother who had spent nine years working in Cuba to help bring her family from Poland to safety in Cuba on the eve of the Holocaust. And I felt a need for reconnection with this place that had been a refuge for my Jewish family. And I'm the one in the family, I guess in every family, there's someone like that who really felt the need to reconnect with Cuba and I've been going back and forth uh, for many years. And when I went back on those first few visits, the very, uh, one of the very first few visits, uh, my great aunt and great uncle, um, they had had a son who died in Cuba of leukemia, was buried in Cuba in 1954. And when we left Cuba in the 60s, of course, his grave had to be left behind. And when I went back, they said, please take a picture and find out if his grave is still there because they were afraid that maybe it would have been defaced or, or mistreated. I went to the cemetery in Guanabacoa, which is on the outskirts of Havana. I found the grave. It was in perfect shape. It was being very, very well taken care of. And then I found out that the woman who had been his nanny and her older, her younger sister had been my nanny, those two women, two black Cuban women, they had been taking care of this grave that was the grave of a Jewish boy um, in Cuba. And that, I think, for me is where the bridge to Cuba began in that sense that, um, that there were other people holding on to Jewish memory for us back in Cuba. They didn't have to do that, but it was just an act of kindness and love that they uh, showed to my family. And I think that's where my desire to create bridges to Cuba began, these bridges of sentiment, of feeling, of emotion, of ties across time and across history. And when I edited my anthology 20 years ago called Bridges to Cuba, conversations between Cubans on the island and the diaspora were still pretty rare, pretty far and far between, and the process of reconciliation was just beginning. Our lives had been ruptured by politics and by ideology. It was almost as if a civil war had broken uh, between us and broken us as a nation. But I wondered, what did we still have in common as a, as a culture? Was there something about being Cuban that united us and made us one people? And if there was, how were we to tell these shared stories? And that was the question that we tried to answer in Bridges to Cuba, an anthology that came out 20 years ago, and it brought together 80 writers and scholars and artists. And our motto was that walls turned on their sides can be bridges. And many were part of the generation um, that had left Cuba as children. We were searching for a lost childhood. I call myself and others of that generation niños viejos. I call myself una niña vieja, an old child. And on the island, I found that people were trying to understand who we were, uh, because we seemed to live, those that had left, we seemed to live in two worlds. And we were seeking a bridge between past and present. Now, 20 years later, we're living in a very, very different moment with the restoration of ties between the US and Cuba. And there's now a 20th anniversary edition of Bridges to Cuba out with a beautiful cover by Rolando Esteves. And I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs from that to bring us up to date. When the news broke on December 17th, 2014, 
of restored ties between the US and Cuba, it felt thrilling that Cuba was in the spotlight. My mother and father, who'd never been back to Cuba since we left in the early 60s, reacted in typical fashion. My father said the United States was condoning another 50 years of tyranny on the island, but my mother began to dream of finally going back to visit Cuba. Maybe, she said, daydreaming out loud, the ferry will begin operating again. My father once said he would even go back only if the ferry service from Key West or Miami to Havana were restored, thinking this would never happen. But now as our family drama is being played out on the world stage, there is great expectation that the ferry and other bridges between the US and Cuba will soon become a reality. I've been waiting forever for this Cuban moment to arrive. So why then am I a little ambivalent about the fanfare around Cuba? Aren't bridges what I wanted? Like other Cubans, I feel distressed when I observe the mushrooming of numerous instant experts who are marketing an exotic and distorted image of Cuba. In the mad rush to get to Cuba and to figure out Cuba, there's a terrible silencing taken place. We are not paying enough attention to the more subtle and poetic voices of those who've been experiencing Cuba for a lifetime. And that's what we hope to do in this panel, is to share the voices of those who have been experiencing Cuba for a lifetime. This past June, Richard Blanco and I created a blog called Bridges to From Cuba, and we want to create a space that can serve as a forum for Cubans to express the poetry of this unfolding moment, a moment of anxieties and hopes, of doubts and dreams, a moment when we're trying to create a bridge to the future. We invite all of you to read our blog and to give us your comments and to send us your contributions. So we're very fortunate to have an incredible group of panelists today, all of them dear friends of mine that I've known for 20 years. And we're going to start with Rolando Esteves, who is the most incredible book artist that you'll ever know, coming from Matanzas, Cuba. Rolando Esteves. Muchas gracias. Eh, doy las gracias a todos los organizadores de este evento porque nos han permitido eh, comunicarnos esta tarde con ustedes. Cuando yo pienso en la palabra puente, eh, hay, un, hay algo que inmediatamente viene a mi memoria y es que vivo, nací y vivo en una ciudad surcada por tres ríos, por lo tanto los puentes son la ciudad de Matanzas tiene un nombre un poco horrendo, un poco sanguinario. Pero en esa ciudad de Matanzas está surcada por tres ríos con 10 o 12 o 15 puentes que nos ayudan a conducirnos de un área o de una zona a otra zona de la ciudad. Por lo tanto, desde mi nacimiento estoy condicionado por la palabra puente y por el puente físico que me hace pasar de Pueblo Nuevo a Versailles o de Matanzas a Pueblo Nuevo. Ese sentido de puente también en otra imagen viene a mi memoria en un niño de ocho años, en el niño de ocho años que yo fui hace ya muchos años, que tenía su primer pasaporte. Ese primer pasaporte que no entendía muy bien aquel niño y no lo entendía muy bien y sus padres le explicaban que era un pequeño librito que había que mostrar en un aeropuerto cuando nos fuéramos a mudar a otra ciudad que estaba fuera de Cuba. Es decir, que desde los ocho años en mi casa eh, se oía hablar de pasaportes, de pasaportes, de money orders y de todos esos eh, complicados sistemas migratorios que tuvo y tiene la isla y tienen tantos lugares del mundo porque Cuba no es eh, privativa del, del exilio, es un exilio eh, directo 
fundamentalmente hacia este país, fundamentalmente hacia, hacia esta ciudad de Matanza. Pasaron los años, pasaron eh, ocho años más y nunca llegaba eh, la salida de aquella familia que tenía este niño en Cuba. Por lo tanto, cuando el niño cumplió 15 años, ya había entrado en su edad militar y por lo tanto no podía ya irse de Cuba. La familia, tratando de conversar con su hijo, conmigo, le preguntaban, ¿qué hacemos? ¿Nos quedamos todos aquí o te quedas tú y nos vamos? Tú vas a ir muy cerca, muy pronto. Y sencillamente eh, el niño se quedó con la idea de que unos años después se iba a unir a sus padres, aquel niño que ya tenía 15 años. Recuerdo muy bien que aquel, aquel sistema migratorio tenía, tuvo muchas etapas. En el principio de los 60 estuvo eh, los pequeños barquitos que salían de Camarioca, pero había una forma migratoria más eh, fuerte, que era el llamado puente aéreo, puente aéreo. Ese puente aéreo es el que usaron mis padres para venir a Estados Unidos y para radicarse aquí desde el año 1969. Por lo tanto, me quedé en Cuba y en Cuba me enamoré y en Cuba hice otra pequeña familia y nunca más vine a vivir con mi familia aquí en Miami. Es decir, que los sentidos de los puentes familiares, se, los puentes se levantan, los puentes se rompen, se vuelven a levantar y ese ha sido un poco el sentido de mi vida con respecto a la, a la familia y al arte, que también es otra familia importante que uno tiene. Un poco, un poco de tiempo después me inventé estos libros que en el año 85 se llamaron Libros de las Ediciones Vigía, unos raros libros hechos con eh, recortes de papeles distintos, diversos, hechos con papel craft, eh, entintados en mimeógrafos, entintados en máquinas risográficas que son muy sencillas. Y estos libros eh, están llenos de tiempo, porque hacer cada uno de estos libros lleva un tiempo de la vida de un pequeño grupo de artesanos y de artistas. Estos libros también han sido un puente de mi vida. Gracias a estos libros conocí a Ruth Bejar en el año 94 y ya gozamos de 21 años de amistad muy sólida. El puente que se establece entre Matanzas y Michigan se establece a través de Ruth Bejar. Y entonces pienso que el arte es también un puente. Un libro es un puente de papel. Estos libros están no solo en Michigan, están aquí en la Universidad de Miami, están en el MoMA, están en muchos lugares de este país y, y siguen comportándose como pequeños puentes de papel. Yo me he prometido que toda mi vida estaré haciendo estos libros, que ahora se llaman Ediciones El Fortín. Toda mi vida estaré haciendo estos libros, por lo tanto, toda mi vida voy a estar fabricando puentes de papel para los cubanos hacia Estados Unidos y para los norteamericanos hacia Cuba. Muchas gracias. I'm going to translate. Does everybody speak Spanish? Okay, okay. So, so I was taking very good notes. It's one of the good things about being an anthropologist is I learned to take notes. So, so I have notes and I'm going to translate or at least um, do a summary of what he said because he said some really incredible things, Rolando Esteves. So he started by, by talking about what the word bridges means to him. And he lives in the city of Matanzas. And he doesn't like the name of the city because... Some of you will know what Matanzas means, and it means killings or slaughter. And so he doesn't like being in a city called slaughter. And so he is uh, involved in a campaign to change the name of the city to Bellamar, to Beautiful Sea, instead of uh, Matanzas. Um, so he mentioned that, that he lives in the city with a horrendous uh, name. And it's a city with three rivers and about 15 bridges. So he's always crossing physical bridges um, in Matanzas, uh, just getting between Matanzas and Pueblo Nuevo. 
uh, nearby town to, to Matanza. So he's always thinking about bridges in his in his day-to-day -day life. And then he recalled uh, when he was eight years old, that was the first time he got a passport. His family got him a passport. He didn't know what it meant, being a boy of eight years old. And he would hear these terms, passport. He also heard the term money order. And, and he was aware that this, something complicated was going on, but wasn't quite sure what it meant. The years passed, eight years passed, and he was then of military age in Cuba at the time in 1969. He was 15 years old and a young man of military age could not leave Cuba. It was impossible for a, a boy of that age to immigrate. And so his family had a very difficult, wrenching decision to make. Do we all stay or do you stay? And we'll come back for you later. This was his parents and his younger sister who was eight years old at the time. And the idea was, well, you'll stay and we'll come back for you soon. And so as he put it, the boy stayed. 15 years old, and they thought that he would just stay for a short while and would eventually leave, but he ended up um, falling in love, um, having a family, uh, building a family in Cuba, and his family left with the air bridge, as he called it, the Puente um, Aéreo, and so he never got to live with his family again. They came to Miami, his parents and sister, and he stayed um, in Matanzas. And so for him, um, art has become like uh, his family. And since 1985, he's been making these really beautiful, um, unique uh, books. And they're made always with simple uh, brown paper and using fragments and bits and pieces, and initially with uh, mimeograph, to make something beautiful out of poor things. And um, the books take time, as he says. They're, they're, they're basically a, a symbol of time passing. It takes a long time to make them. It involves artisans. And he's also built a very, very beautiful bridge between Matanzas and Michigan. Over the years, we've become very close friends and have collaborated on books together. And, um, and so there's a bridge to Michigan. He's come a couple of times as an artist in residence. And so we formed this really beautiful bridge. And so he says, in conclusion, art is a bridge. He now has his own independent imprint. And he's the first person in Cuba to have this independent small imprint, El Fortin. He's doing this all by himself. Very, very difficult to do, but he's doing it. And, um, and as he says, all my life, I will be making uh, these books, both for Cubans and for people in the United States. So he's constantly going to be building bridges through his books. Thank you. When we talk about bridges, I think what we're really talking about is conversation. And uh, unfortunately, when that conversation involves Cuba, it can be loaded with distractions and, um, and agendas and all those things that can fill political speeches but can make a conversation, uh, can kind of sink a conversation. Um, but here's the thing. I think a conversation can also happen internally, and I believe a conversation can also happen with yourself, and it can happen many miles away from Cuba. It could happen in Miami. It could happen anywhere. Um, for me, that, uh, the, the point of entry into a conversation about Cuba is identity, is matters of identity, and, um, and it really goes, obviously, to the core of, of, of who we are um, in order to reach that point of entry, uh, you know, sometimes it, it's it's hard to kind of shut out a little bit the noise. I I always say just let Cuba find you. Let Cuba f let yourself find Cuba in in daily life. And I think you can do this um, when you appro approach the topic from an identity standpoint, not as an Anthony Bourdain and not as a, an ad agency or not as an outsider, but when you do it with an internal dialogue and, and, um, and uh, you, know, you can allow Cuba to find you that way. Uh, I find it in music. I find Cuba every day in music. I find Cuba every day in you know, the lilt of language that I hear uh, you know, fragments 
that I overhear in West Palm Beach where, you know, I, I work. Uh, I find it in food. In fact, I conjure Cuba in my kitchen constantly. I'm now the uh, food editor for the Palm Beach Post, and I just, I, I love uh, stories about food. I love um, you know, stories about how recipes came to be, how they are passed along, you know, from one relative to another, uh, from one generation to another. So this week, uh, I'm going to conjure Cuba once again in my kitchen when I make my mother's black beans for, for uh, Thanksgiving, because you know we have to have that alien dish always <laughs> in, in Thanksgiving, you know, and our alien dish is always the, the black beans, and I my mom passed away in 2006 and I, every year I still make that big batch of, of beans exactly how she used to do it. I mean, I don't know if it comes out the same, but uh, you know, the, the, the secret is that little touch of, of sherry at the end. But I'm gonna tell you, it's an infallible bridge. It is, it is, it is an infallible bridge. I travel to Cuba on a raft of sofrito, constantly, <laughs> constantly with aromas, with memories, it just, it gets me. Um, and for me, personally, in my life, that's enough right now. For me, that's enough. And, and I feel that it's as valid as is the Cuba of the next great mojito maker, you know? Because in that hip Havana that's gonna happen, and you know, as predicted by Anthony Bourdain, uh, you know, the, the next great, I feel that this Cuba for me is just, is just as valid, and I, I allow Cuba to find me in Palm Beach just as my parents found Cuba in Hialeah, you know? So I'm, I'm very, uh, I, I, I feel very fortunate that um, I can still have that intimacy with the country of my birth. Um, I be there's a misconception. I think people believe you know, Cuba belongs to a government. Cuba belongs to a generation. Cuba belongs to a group think or a long suffering people. I think that's false. Cuba belongs to me. Cuba belongs to you. Cuba belongs to all of us here. I feel I have a birthright, personally, to walk those streets and to claim Cuba, not only in physical dimensions, but to claim it in figurative dimensions as well. And, um, you know, I can do that being an American. I'm an American. I'm a proud American. Uh, and that ever-flowing conversation that is Cuba will always be part of my soul. Uh, I went to Cuba when I was 23 years old. I went to the place I was born, Puerto Padre. I walked those streets, unpaved, the, the streets outside the house where, um, where my parents lived. Uh, and it was such a gift to me because it, it informed my soul who I was. I mean, I, I felt that after I'd, I had been there and I had seen the way my parents, you know, the, the places where my parents met, for instance, and where they, um, you know, grew up and, uh, you know, even to bathe by dipping a fruit can in, in water uh, the way that, that they did once upon a time. I could go anywhere in the world after that and I knew where I had come from and I knew who I was. Um, I believe that, that, I, that fragment of identity, no matter how old I get, I, it will always be with me. And that's what I can personally bring to this table. And I can also bring an open heart, I can, and I can bring open ears to talk about your Cuba, whether it's physical, memory, or aromatic. Thank you. Bueno, muchas gracias a los organizadores de este evento por darme la posibilidad de llegar acá a Miami una vez más. Y sobre todo teniendo en cuenta lo difícil que siempre resulta eh, organizar los intercambios académicos por todas estas trabas burocráticas que todavía existen para que cubanos de ambas orillas podamos viajar libremente. Tres generaciones de cubanos llevamos como apuntar a nuestro escritor Leonardo Padura alguna huella más o menos dolorosa, incluso trágica en ocasiones del diferendo político entre Cuba y Estados Unidos. Estar sentado aquí, en esta Feria de Miami, delante de ustedes, ocurre en, que momen, en momentos en que cubanos de, aquella, de ambas orillas apenas tomamos conciencia del final de esa especie de interminable pesadilla en que hemos vivido. A mi mente acuden 
muchos recuerdos, algunos muy tristes, de mi lejana infancia, cuando partieron o desaparecieron de mi entorno, seres muy queridos, y la familia comenzó a desgarrarse sin que la euforia de los sustanciales cambios iniciados en 1959 permitiera a los adultos percatarse del drama que comenzamos a vivir todos. Vinieron tiempos de desencuentro y enfrentamientos violentos. No coincidían todos los cubanos en la idea de un proyecto de país para el futuro. Más, solo referiré cómo hemos construido a, largo, a lo largo de estos años esos puentes emocionales de los cuales habló Ruth, por el cual avanzamos un grupo de cubanos y estadounidenses con el mayor respeto a la dignidad y el decoro que debe acompañar la existencia humana. Eso nos conduce a los años de profunda crisis material, pero sobre todo espiritual, que vivimos en Cuba en el llamado periodo especial. Por entonces, los cubanos solo pensábamos en cómo sobrevivir. De aquellos tiempos es cuando tuve la oportunidad en un viaje que hice a la finca La Rosita, en la zona de Central Espartaco, de conocer a la familia de Richard Blanco, en casa de Matías Falcón y Delia Valdés, allí se hablaba de la, con mucho cariño de la maestra Gema, que estaba fuera de Cuba, pero que siempre había mantenido los lazos con la familia. Y esa se quedó en mi memoria, y no, no sería una sorpresa para mí el día que apareció Richard Blanco, y de pronto conversando allá, en la unidad, iba a leer unas, unos poemas, eh, nos damos cuenta que estábamos conectados desde aquella época, lo que no, me, no nos habíamos percatado de, de la situación. Y bueno, desde esos momentos tristes para los cubanos, pero también momentos en que los cubanos también sub, supimos mantener la dignidad en las peores condiciones, justamente conocí a este poeta que está a mi lado, al cual le, le expreso un gran cariño en, en estos tiempos. Como le decía, en estos difíciles tiempos, en que solo pensábamos en la sobrevivencia, aparecieron algunos intelectuales de diferentes países un poco interesados por el llamado caso Cuba. Y justamente en, ese, en esos avatares apareció un escritor llamado Tom Miller, norteamericano. Tom eh, quería hacer un libro que después salió a la luz pública bajo el, libro, bajo el nombre de Un viaje a, la, a través de la Cuba de Castro. Pero lo que le interesaba a él en ese libro era saber cómo vivíamos los cubanos. Imagínense en aquella época que los cubanos estábamos tan agobiados y también tan, tan preocupados por la presencia de personas ajenas a la, a la vida cotidiana nuestra, que se aparecieron un americano con tremendo proyecto. Al final ya me tenía un poco cansado y para quitármelo de arriba, le dije, mira, tú quieres saber cómo vive un cubano, vamos para mi casa. Había tremendo pagón esa noche y realmente... Eh, lo que había en mi casa, con toda necesidad se lo dio, era un plato de arroz para todo el mundo, un huevo para la hija mía más chiquita, Anabel, que es una mujer, acaba de parir hace unos días, y no había más nada. Y le dije, mira, esto es lo que hay, mi hermano, tú quieres comer con nosotros, siéntate ahí. Arroz, el huevo para la niña, y vamos a ver qué aparece. En eso pasó un vendedor vendiendo tamales, y le compramos un tamal al vendedor, Partimos el tamal como hacemos en Cuba, en cuatro, y después la vecina por la cerca de la casa nos dijo, hice fruto de dulce fruta bomba, ¿quieren? Y pasaron el fruto, el, la fruta bomba por la cerca y así compusimos la comida de esa noche, que fue una noche afortunada, en otras ocasiones solo podíamos darle a la niña lo mejor que conseguíamos. Y así, eh, más tarde apareció Michel Soisk, un alemán que procedía de la Universidad de Colonia, alto, inmenso, parecía un nazi, y cuando sería mi asombro cuando veo a aquel hombre preguntando por mí, le dije, ¿a ti quién mandó a preguntar por mí? Así en fuego, un apagón. Yo ahí no estaba ni pensando en escribir ni hacer nada, yo tenía mis libros guardados. Cuando aquello no, eh, era máquina de escribir, no tenía papel, la máquina no tenía cinta, yo realmente estaba ni escribiendo a lápiz. Y entonces le dije, mire, coja ahí lo que yo tengo ahí, mi hecho, y usted utilícelo, porque yo realmente no veo la, la luz al final del túnel, y realmente utilícelo, porque yo pienso que eso no va a salir más nunca. Al final, le presté mis cosas y empezamos una amistad que, que me permitió también conocer la realidad que él había vivido en Alemania Oriental, porque realmente Michel Soisk se había formado en la Escuela del Aisi, de Historia del Aisi, y Michel tenía la experiencia de Alemania Oriental, de todo lo que había sucedido en Alemania Oriental. 
y él estaba eh, estudiando la esclavitud, pero realmente yo creo que lo que más le preocupaba era qué iba a pasar en Cuba. Y desde entonces empezamos también a, a, a vincularnos a otras personas a través de él, y en este caso, sobre todo a alguien que, que en estos tiempos en que estamos hablando de, de puentes y donde Ruth ha tenido un protagonismo tremendo, te lo agradezco, siempre te lo he dicho, pero no puedo dejar de mencionar a Rebeca Scott, profesora de la Universidad de Michigan, quizás la, la primera norteamericana que pudo hacer un doctorado en Cuba en los años 80, porque no le daban permiso, pero ella, como es tan insistente, bueno, quien la conozca sabe hasta qué punto es capaz de lograr las cosas Rebeca Scott, al final hizo su doctorado, publicó un libro que es un, un clásico de la historiografía cubana, y más que eso, abrió un camino también para que investigadores de ambas orillas y sobre todo de la Universidad de Vinchida empezaran a llegar a Cuba. Y en este caso, en La Habana la bloqueaban en todo lo que hacía, pero como no llegó a Cienfuegos, donde no había tanto control quizás, y donde el Instituto de Historia de Cuba no tenía tanta influencia, y la conocí a través de Michael, empezamos a pensar cosas, y apareció alguien que está aquí en la feria, que queremos mucho, Ada Ferrell, una cubana que de niña había salido y era alumna de doctorado de la Universidad de Michigan, apareció a Ada y fueron apareciendo otros estudiantes y de ahí se nos ocurrió hacer un taller de historia donde invitamos a muchos historiadores que en Cuba no eran bien vistos por sus enfoques, por su manera de abordar la historia, aun cuando algunos de ellos eran marxistas convencidos, como puede ser Fernando Martínez Heredia o puede ser Jorge Barra, pero la idea era traer a historiadores de diferentes visiones, de diferentes concepciones, metodologías y maneras de abordar la historia, incluso hasta antropólogos, porque fue el caso también de Fernando Coronil, y de esa manera inventamos un taller. Aquello fue tremendo porque eh, se nos ocurrió invitar a Alejandro La Fuente, quien por entonces había decidido, lo habían puesto en la disyuntiva de regresar a Cuba y no hacer un doctorado, o hacer un doctorado fuera de Cuba. Y él decidió hacer un doctorado fuera de Cuba y por tanto le pusieron la etiqueta de traidor. Pero bueno, es un historiador muy talentoso, uno de los mejores historiadores, hoy es profesor en la Universidad de Harvard y invitamos a Alejandro a la Fuente. Para darle la visa fue tremendo, pero llegó Alejandro a la Fuente y ahí empezamos a bifurcar los caminos, caminos que eh, siempre pensamos que tenían que ser en ambas direcciones lo cual nos llevó a algunos de nosotros a visitar Estados Unidos por primera vez cuando se viajaba por terceros países. Y así llegamos a Michigan, en este caso llegué yo uno de ellos y conocí a Ruth, que en ese momento también tenía este proyecto que, que hizo alusión a Esteve y este, tenía en su casa una pintora nombrada Rocío García que, la, que estaba exponiendo en Michigan. Ahí empezamos a soñar nosotros también y se abrió otro camino, que es el camino en que Ruth ha, ha instrumentado los encuentros entre jóvenes cubanos y jóvenes eh, norteamericanos. Es decir, estudiantes de universidades con ambas estudiantes de acá, más profesores. Y eso nos permitió ir abriendo el, el espacio de debate. O sea que, que tuvimos dos caminos en esta idea de que teníamos que tender los puentes en ambas direcciones. Como ustedes pueden imaginar... Eh, las trabas surgieron de inmediato, las incomprensiones, las acusaciones infundadas de que estábamos trabajando para el enemigo, cuando el enemigo yo creo que es mental, es en la actitud que, actúe, eh, que asumen las personas con respecto a cuestiones que son naturales como estos intercambios, como debe ser natural que los cubanos que viven en la isla como los que viven acá, siguiendo, eh, sigamos siendo los hermanos de siempre, siguiendo siendo, eh, sigamos siendo los cubanos de una misma patria como soñó Martí. Entonces, eh, en esos tiempos, bueno, vinieron las dificultades. Nosotros habíamos trazado una estrategia, y Ruth no me dejará mentir, de llevar estos proyectos al resto de la isla. Lo pudimos hacer en el caso de, de nosotros con, con Santiago, lo hicimos en La Habana, los talleres, pero ya después hubo las dificultades. Al final resultó... Eh, de esos proyectos, varios libros, uno de ellos, Espacio, Silencio y los Sentidos de la Libertad, Cuba 1819 eh, eh, a 1879, se convirtió en, en uno de los libros más aportadores a la historiografía cubana, le dio un vuelco porque cambió la mirada y sobre todo le dio voz y rostro 
a sujetos históricos que estaban invisibilizados. Y también sacó a la luz, a la luz digamos, problemas que hoy subsisten en la sociedad cubana, como es los problemas raciales, la discriminación, las distintas maneras de discriminación, porque todavía esos problemas en Cuba no están solucionados y por ende hay que sacarlo y darle visibilidad para poder asumirlo como sociedad. Por otros caminos también eh, pudimos eh, involucrar un grupo de jóvenes, algunos de los cuales con todo el derecho del mundo hoy viven acá, hacen sus proyectos acá y nosotros también en esa batalla, porque todos tengan los espacios que se merecen, hemos logrado que se despolitice el hecho de que la gente haga su proyecto de vida fuera de la isla y se le considere como un ciudadano más y no se lo considere como un individuo que traicionó a un proyecto. De manera tal que estos caminos en que hemos eh, estado trabajando, que han sido caminos no, lleno, no fáciles, han estado llenos de obstáculos, también nos han llevado a mover ideas, a cambiar maneras de, de asumir la aplicación de la política cultural, pero también la aplicación de otras políticas, como puede ser el hecho también del derecho a viajar, Quizás ustedes no sepan las batallas que se dieron dentro del seno de la intelectualidad cubana para que esa limitación que se le ponía a la a la, al viaje de los cubanos fuese eliminada, porque realmente es un derecho constitucional que está de siempre en la constitución nuestra y que por razones eh, muy justificadas quizás hace 60 años, 50 años, funcionaron, pero pasados 50 años era una violación de derechos tan elementales como son los derechos humanos. Y esa batalla la ganamos, yo creo que hace dos años todos los cubanos pueden viajar libremente. Lo que pasa es que ahora nos queda la batalla más difícil. No tenemos la economía para pagarnos el viaje porque el salario no nos alcanza. Entonces, siempre en estos caminos por el mejoramiento humano nos vamos a encontrar con obstáculos. Pero yo creo que lo más importante de este proyecto que estamos asumiendo desde la, el aspecto emocional, desde, desde el aspecto humano, es sencillamente hacer que los puentes no se derrumben no se caigan y que sea para siempre y no como en otras ocasiones que han sido bloqueados. Muchas gracias. So that was really fascinating. I'm going to attempt a brief translation. <laughs> Took lots of notes. <laughs> Summary here. Um, so, uh, so Orlando Garcia began by talking about some of the, the difficulties of, of these interchanges. He himself actually went through a, a lot of difficulties just to get here for the book fair, getting his visa um, and so on. And, um, and that he's very glad that now we're at a stage where Cubans of both shores are, are moving beyond the, uh, the, the blocked relationship that we had before, um, that he remembers as a young man how sad it was watching people leaving uh, Cuba after 1959, all of these beloved people that were leaving and the drama and the trauma that that involved for those who stayed uh, behind. And, um, and so he remembers the, um, the emotional bridges that began to be formed um, in the early 90s. That was the time called the special period, a time of material and moral a crisis um, in Cuba, and everybody was worried about how to survive, just how to, how to, how to, how to make it from one day to another, how to find enough uh, food to put on, on the table. And, um, and that's when all these bridges begin in that period in the early 90s. And, um, and he recently met, uh, met Richard Blanco. Uh, Richard and I were in Cuba in June, and we went to Cienfuegos, since uh, Richard's family is from Cienfuegos. And it turned out that Orlando uh, knew um, a maestra, now maestra Gema is so, to mama. So he knew. Uh -huh. So Orlando knew Richard's mother, uh, who's who's right here, <laughs> who uh, had been a very very beloved teacher, and um, and so he you know he knew about her. She was a teacher that people still spoke about, even though they had left uh, Cuba. And so then when we went back to Cuba, cor correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm not telling the story correctly, uh, Richard. So when we went back, suddenly as they started talking about all of the Cienfuegos connections, it's like, wait, but I know your mother. <laughs> um, is, that, is that pretty much it? Of, of her, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so that was pretty amazing. And, and again, just a way of saying that people in Cuba didn't forget 
yet those of us who left, that there were still fond memories of, of those of us that uh, had left uh, the island. So going back to the difficult time in the early 90s, this was a time that people in Cuba were just thinking of survival, making it from day to day, and, um, and Orlando mentioned that a writer named Tom Miller, who wrote a book called Trading with the Enemy, he appeared um, in Cuba in Cienfuegos, and he kept asking, how do Cubans live? How do Cubans live? What's it like to, to be a Cuban, etc.? And Orlando just finally uh, got tired and just said, okay, you want to see how Cubans live? Well, come to my house. And this is the early 90s, again, time of great um, shortages and so on. And uh, they got to his house, and there was an apagón, in other words, a blackout. There was no electricity, he got there, and, um, and the only thing that was available for dinner was rice and an egg that was for um, the child um, in the family. And he said, this is what we have, rice and egg for the child, and let's see what else appears. And a man appeared selling tamales, and so they bought one tamal, and they cut it into four pieces so they could each get a tamal. And they thought, well, let's see if anything else appears. And then a next door neighbor appeared, a lady appeared, uh, giving them uh, some sweets, some dulces made out of fruta bomba, out of papaya. So, so suddenly they had dessert too. Um, so it kind of all came together. Um, subsequently, an East German um, scholar um, came by and um, to Cienfuegos and Orlando said, well, how did you find me? Um, and he, at the time, was feeling very depressed. He wasn't doing his scholarship. He didn't have paper. He didn't have ribbon for his typewriter at the time. And, um, and he, he, lent, he lent some of his research materials to the scholar, and that was how Orlando started coming back to his scholarship. Orlando is a specialist in the history of slavery um, in Cuba. And, um, and this uh, scholar came and, and started basically encouraging him to go back to his research. And then my colleague, Rebecca Scott, who's a historian, and she mentored um, Ada Ferrer, who's here at the book fair. And um, Ada just recently wrote a book about Cuba and, um, and Haiti. And so Rebecca Scott started traveling to Cuba, and she was the first American historian um, who pushed and pushed and pushed to be able to do her doctoral research in Cuba in the 1980s. This has all changed since the 90s, but in the 80s, it was still very, very hard to get permission, and she kept pushing till finally she was able to do her doctoral research in, in Cuba, in Cienfuegos in particular, and that opened up a path to other researchers and other scholars um, as well who started uh, going to do research um, in, uh, in Cienfuegos. And so um, I'm gonna just uh, be a little brief now. Um, so, so Orlando talked about creating these different workshops and um, being open to different methods of doing scholarship, Marxist and other uh, methods. Alejandro de la Fuente, um, very interesting scholar, historian now at Harvard, and he had been doing his re he's, he had uh, been doing his research in Cuba, but then he decided to um, to do his uh, dissertation writing in the United States, and because of that, they called him a traitor back at that time, and um, and then they tried to get him to come back to Cuba to uh, to be in a workshop that was very very difficult, but he finally um, got his visa. And anyway, I happened to have met <laughs> I met Orlando in Michigan because he was invited by uh, Rebecca Scott, and I was holding a party for this artist that I had invited, uh, Rocio Garcia, and that was actually when I first uh, met um, Orlando. And I want to just add one very personal story. Voy a contarles lo de la pulmonía. So, so many, many years ago when I was in Cuba, um, I actually became very, very sick. I've never told my family, so don't, don't tell my mother, uh, my aunt and uncle are here, because uh, I don't want them to get worried. But many, many years ago I was in Cuba, I got very, very sick. I didn't know what I had, and I just kept going. I had a fever, I was very ill. And I got to Cienfuegos, and immediately Orlando, who, who knew me, he said, you're not well, I have to take you to a doctor. And we went to the hospital, and a friend of his is a doctor there, and they just said to me, just if they ask you your name, say you are Ruth, Ruth Fernandez. No digas pejar, because they're not going to know what no that is. Y que no hablara mucho, porque o sea, mi acento no, no es muy perfecto en, 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 en el español cubano. No hables mucho. Y la ropa no hables mucho. Y, y si, te dicen, si te preguntan quién eres, tú eres Ruth Fernández. So I went and they, you know, they did the x-ray and it turned out I had this terrible pneumonia. And, um, 
Yeah, <laughs> and right, and and we did all this because they took me to the to the public Cuban hospital, so that I wouldn't have to pay anything. Because as you know, you know, a medical attention is free, and so I got free attention. <laughs> I got the X-ray done. It turned out that I had this terrible pneumonia. I was supposed to go on to Eastern Cuba, and his friend, the doctor, said, "Well, you, you can go on to Eastern Cuba, but if you do, then you'll probably be in a hospital. Um, so you may not want to do that." So I didn't, and thanks to Orlando as well, his um, his wife had stockpiled some um, antibiotics, and so they had some antibiotics that I was able to take and start to get better. Um, and then I came back to Michigan and I had to be in bed for two weeks. So anyway, so, so I think that Orlando saved my life um, <laughs> as well. <laughs> <laughs> And um, but anyway, but we but we met in Cuba. He was there for this uh, workshop with um, with Rebecca Scott. And um, anyway, so um, so he's really glad. Just to to end it here, he's very very glad that that we're now in a different space and that there's more um, openness for debates, for discussion. That there should be more brotherhood and sisterhood back and forth um, across the border. He talked about Jose Marti that we're the same people the same country and that um, it's important to uh, continue um, creating uh, these bridges. So thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. When I thought, is this on? Yeah. Yes? They know. Okay. <laughs> Buenas tardes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for all your wonderful comments. You're giving me so much to think about. I have notes all over the place. Number one is I wish I, I wish I could talk Spanish like Orlando, and I wish I could take notes like Ruth. I mean, that's just <laughs> insane, right? <laughs> so, what she just was able to do on the spot. <laughs> When Orlando starts talking in Cuba, when we, when we visited, me quedo bobo así, like, you know, I'm just like, it's just the, the stuff that comes out of, out of his Spanish. It's like, damn, I wish I knew Spanish that way. Anyway, um, I'd like to give you really a brief uh, sort of uh, tour of what Bridges has been in my life and sort of how both, both physical as an engineer, uh, both uh, proverbial, literal, and artistic and all the rest rather quickly. Um, I don't know if this is getting old for Miami already, but as I like to say, I was made in Cuba, assembled in Spain, and imported to the United States. So my mother left seven months pregnant from Cuba, I was born in Madrid, and 45 days later, later after my birth, we emigrated to New York, New York and eventually to Miami. And of course, the, what that signifies for me among many things is that the idea of crossing already by the time I was 45 days old was already sort of in my psyche. And, and beyond that was um, that I was kind of, uh, uh, because my brother, my brother was older, who's also here, I got the whole familia here, um, <laughs> who was, uh, who's actually looks younger than me now, but um, <laughs> we'll say he was 20 years older than me. Um, uh, he, I was the first person in the family to learn English and Spanish, sort of. I learned them at the same time. I don't remember not knowing two languages. And so my first sort of role as a bridge builder was translating. And I remember my parents sort of saying, like, ¿Cómo se dice esto? How do you say that? How do you say the other? And then later on, uh, as an adolescent, like, really being able to really pull the wool over their eyes and tell them all sorts of things in English and get away with linguistic murder. Um, <laughs> Um, didn't, they didn't know one bad word in, in, in English, so it was, it was good. Um, uh, later in life, uh, uh, I think uh, my bridge started in a different way, um, as we all know. And Liz, correct me if I'm wrong, because I have maybe been misquoting you throughout the entire world, that Liz one time said, I don't know if it was to me or in the paper, that we love living in Miami because it's so close to the United States <laughs> and you don't need a passport. And so I think for, you know, all these things we're also talking about here are generational also and what happens with this idea of bridges. But for me, uh, my first bridge was to America, right? Growing up in Miami was a very undiverse culture, the city, especially back in the 70s and 80s. Everybody was Cuban. I mean, everybody was like me or my parents or my, or my grandparents, the community at large. And so as a little kid, it's only natural sort of the instinct is to 
we don't always accept our given culture because it's your parents, right? And I could be cool, lo quince, you know, we're not doing that. <laughs> so the idea was that I wanted to see that mythic America. I wanted a bridge to that America that I had seen on TV and that America that we I didn't really quite access yet. Um, but of course, as is natural, as you grow up, as you mature, and as you start realizing that you're given culture, your birthright, as Liz was saying, that sense of really starting to come into your own and knowing this, these aren't just a bunch of old, you know, stories that a bunch of old folks in the family are telling, but this, this is really part of who I am. And so I began another bridge towards Cuba, mostly through my art. So my bridge didn't begin at one end and end at another, but really began in the middle, and I was sort of building a bridge sort of in both directions, um, kind of the opposite, the way you're supposed to build a bridge um, from one side to the other um, in engineering. And uh, that middle point was, of course, Miami, and that's sort of what, how that's happened. Um, but they were both uh, very unfinished bridges. Um, um, in some ways, um, even though I... Um, Started, went to Cuba for the first time in 1994 uh, to, again, meet my mother, left her entire family behind in Cuba, uh, her eight brothers and sisters, La Delia, everybody. Um, and so I needed to, re to sort of see that that really happened. I needed to see those people for I needed to see those landscapes. But it was also not, it, it was a bridge, but it wasn't to the place that I needed to go yet. And it was a bridge that was sort of, in a way, you had to come back because especially in 1994 and in the trips that I've been since, the possibility of even thinking about having a real intimate relationship with the island emotionally and otherwise wasn't really, wasn't really a possibility, right? It's still kind of strange. Um, sometimes Ruth and I always comment that, that you'd cross when you come back, the minute you get off from Miami International Airport, it just seems that all that that just happened was just this dream that just something, just something, that really happened? Did we just go to Cuba? Did we just meet Rolando and Esteves and all this stuff? But in any case, so that bridge was finished. And the Cuba, the, my bridge, the, the side towards America was also sort of not finished. Um, in a way, uh, as much as I tried, um, I never really felt, I still felt that I needed to be that mythic Peter Brady or Marsha Brady, that little kid on TV. And even though I was living, I'd lived up north in Connecticut and whatnot, and eventually even in Maine. And um, this is where I was when Ruth and I first decided to go to, to Cuba just this last June in some ways. Um, well, no, before that, I think, there was a sense that I'm just gonna be this person in this middle of this bridge that doesn't reach either place. And that's my life. And that's okay. And then Obama called <laughs> and said, Richard, write a poem for America. I can't do an Obama impersonation. I wish I could <laughs> Richard, <no. laughs> write a poem for America. And then suddenly that bridge did get finished in some ways. One of the greatest gifts of the inauguration of the whole process of writing that poem and the whole process that's still happening to unfolding today is that sense that I was finally sort of, not that I was Peter Brady, but that I realized I didn't have to be Peter Brady to be Americano, to be American, that that was part of the American sort of uh, narrative that had always been there and that it was starting to be recognized and that I belonged to that story and I belonged to that narrative. And sort of the pendulum swung and I was like, I was Peter Brady, um, or, Pe or Pedro something or the other. <laughs> Pe Pedro Blanco, I guess. Uh, and, um, and so um, that other side sort of felt, uh, the, the side to Cuba felt unfinished, and, and I thought, well, that's just the way it's going to be. And it was really weird because I felt so grounded for, in my Americanness, and in and, and, and some weird, all my years I had been looking at America sort of through the lens of the other as a Cubano, looking at the strange land that I live in and trying to connect with that. Then, December 17th, almost two years to the date of when I got the call to the White House for the inaugural poem, this news gets unleashed. And I don't know about you I didn't, or everyone in this audience, but it just sent shockwaves through all of us in good ways and bad ways and just bewildering ways because I realized that that unfinished bridge to Cuba in some ways, whether you were for the embargo, against the embargo, whether, wherever you stood politically, emotionally, in some ways that impossibility was the glue that was holding us. It was in some ways the center of so much that we could all 
would sort of walk around. And suddenly that bottom dropped out. And I took me like four days, you know, I almost had to go into therapy. Um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, I, I thought I knew how, how I felt about Cuba. I thought I knew how I felt about this stuff. And suddenly so many different questions popped up that I had never really occurred to me. Um, I'm gonna just read some of the list here. Would I be now too American for Cuba? Was I really Cuban? What does it mean to be Cuban? Does it mean going around Miami sonando unos cafecitos all day and say coño a few times? <laughs> Suddenly, Cuba became a real place, or, or the possibility of it becoming this real place that I could have a relationship if, as things unfold, as I'm watching them unfold, hopefully. Um, was, and, and also realized that even though I had gone to Cuba five or six times throughout my life, that it was always still a sort of a romantic eye, uh, sort of a dreamy eye, and suddenly realizing that there is a real country here that's been around for, for a lot longer than my little story, and that the country had evolved in its own ways, devolved in its own ways, had its own problems in its own ways. I had a whole other history to catch up with, a whole other art scene to catch up, a whole other sort of community and friends and, and family, new family members. It, it just Cuba suddenly became a real country, um, which I thought I always, I thought I'd, I thought I thought about it that way, but it, no, it seemed that, that really there was so much more to catch up. Um, and one of the things that, other things that sort of really started concerning me or thinking about, um, and this is really, really, really important to me, and this is something that, that I'm, I'm just very anxious about. It's this idea that if, let's say all these changes happen, right? Does that mean that my mother's story gets erased? Does that mean that my Tio Sergio's story in Cuba gets erased? Or if Tia Delia, if as in all these changes, who's going, to be, who's going to be the curator of the history now? Who's going to be the curator of those stories? And it's so important to me that, that none of them get washed out because I don't see it as there's a history here and a history there, but there are these two histories that are really part of one arc of history. And we have to be able to bridge that history and that arc. It's not like, oh, you know, one side won and the other side lost. And it's not that black and white. And this is what I'm calling the emotional bridge, right? The emotional embargo that I think we need to sort of link those things that have been, uh, that have been sort of severed or not talked about really in a way. Those real stories um, and, and not let them be washed away. Um, I'll tell you a couple other things. Um, Yes, two more things. And the idea, I also build bridges as an engineer. Um, well, I'm actually a bridge, uh, one of the things I did was a bridge hydrologist, which is not the guy that opens up the, the, the drawbridge, <laughs> which is what I thought it was when my boss told me uh, we have a bridge, uh, hyd bridge hydrolo hydrology project. But really, what, what really what, where bridge really starts, it's not in the piers, it's not in the cables, it's not in the decks. A bridge starts really below in the things that you can't see. It's in the currents. Uh, my job as a hydrologist was to study the river, to study its history, to understand how it grows, how it swells, how fast it moves, all those things that the eye can't see. And that's ultimately how a bridge stands or how a bridge will fall apart. And I think, or, or collapse, and I think what we're trying to do as bloggers, uh, and the blog, what each of us are trying to do individually, and I love Liz's idea also that, you know, each of us do our own bridge building in our own ways, even if it's just within ourselves, is to look at that stuff that, that you can't see that's going to either make or break the bridge or depend how the bridge is gonna be built, the emotional stuff, the stuff of, of family and all the rest, cultural and all the rest, the stuff that runs in those currents about art and, and family lore and histories and whatnot. Um, and I think that's, that's how Ruth and I have been able to solve that, 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 that moment. You know, we did this in largely because we needed to respond to something. We, we knew that that center had, had fallen out in some ways. And we wanted to protect those stories. Uh, we not our stories here, the stories from the people of Cuba, the stories that often go unheard all the time as a way of making the foundation for whatever that new bridge might look like 
if it ever finishes on, on both sides. And the other thing that I was talking about Ruth recently is, um, and I don't know who said this, maybe it was Liz too. Um, <laughs> Oh, I think it was Fabio Leno. <laughs> que los, los cubanos se creen que son el ombligo del mundo, right? <laughs> and I think what I want us to think about and take home too is the idea that what, what conversations we're having here artistically, academically, uh, culturally, and all the rest is that this world is, the, there's, the, what we're trying to solve here, yes, it's about Cuba or trying to think about Cuba, but it's really larger than that in a way. Look at what's happening in the world. Look at the movements of people. Look at countries and how things, things are getting blurry. The idea of nation is, is blurry and blurry. The idea, the idea of border is blurrier and blurrier every day. Look what's happening with Syria. You know, that, that for us also as, as thinkers and academics, it's really, it's really a foundation to think about larger issues about how, you know, Cuba is just an example of, of one of the fundamental human issues of, uh, that humanity has, and it is this idea of war, this idea of immigration, this idea of movement, et cetera, et cetera. And how we solve it might be something useful, hopefully, uh, or whatever mistakes we also make might be something so, so hopefully useful in, in the long run. And uh, I think, how much time we got? Is that it? So, um, and as I, this is my quote, never give a Cuban a microphone. Um, <laughs> so I'd just like to share in closing just a little excerpt from the, oh, oh yes, and I think that uh, in part that's what, when I was asked, well, two more little things. The idea, <laughs> the, idea of, the idea that I feel personally, that I feel emotional and personal responsibility in these changes that I, I didn't necessarily create, but to participate them and that, uh, participate them in such a way that I, we can affect what that change looks like. Again, to honor and respect the stories of my parents, the exile community, the stories, the equivalent and the counterpart of familia in Cuba, but to make sure that those changes really are towards something meaningful. And, and that's why I chose to step into that moment in, uh, in, in, in the reopening of the U.S. Embassy um, for very personal reasons, but also for posterity and the sake of, of caring, hopefully make, having an effect in some ways, not politically, because what we're talking about here is academically, artistically, and all the rest, but influencing it in some way. So I'd just like to close with um, a, um, uh, a little excerpt from the preface that I wrote to the poem, uh, the chapbook of the poem. I grew up with half a family and half a mother emotionally. I was a fractured person made of two halves, the Cuban half and the American half, connected only by a tenuous hyphen, a so-called Cuban-American. But through the writings of matters of the sea, cosas del mal, and participating in the U.S. Embassy reopening, that mend mending has symbolically begun. I've started to think myself not as a choice between American or Cuban, nor a hyphenated Cuban-American, but an American Cuban. I've realized that indeed, I hope, my heart is big enough to embrace the people of two countries, two cultures, two histories, two homes. I dedicate this poem to my mother, to all those who also need to heal or mend, to those who believe that love, compassion, and communication are key in soothing human distress, individually or collectively, to those who have risked or lost their lives in Cuba or in the sea we share for the sake of change. While politics may sometimes divide people, the deep attachments to family, country, and the memory of home have the power to bring us together. As such, it is my humble hope that this poem may reach deep into our emotional selves, connect us to our shared humanity, and thereby serve as a catalyst for meaningful changes in Cuba and a new understanding among Cubans everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's my, I paid her.
<laughs> Thank you so much, Richard. We're so lucky to have Richard as our poet ambassador right now with Cuba. Thank you so much. So beautiful. I don't know if we do have time for questions or not. So I don't think so. So I let me I just make some today. important announcements. Don't all leave just yet. I just want to let you know, Richard has another panel um, soon at 4.30 um, in the Children's Alley. Uh, his book has been turned into a children's book. Rolando Esteves has another presentation at the Exile Lounge. That's building two, room 2103. And he's going to have his books available for you to look at close up and purchase. Um, if you would like. I want to thank Liz for a beautiful piece that she wrote for our blog, oh, yeah. Manifiesto, Manifiesto, Manifesto of a Cuban Heart. And Orlando also has some of his history books. So I think we go outside now yeah. and the books will be there if you're interested. Thank you so thank much you. to everybody. Thank you. So it was you, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs>